an encouragement, say an amen, and I know that'd be a great help to him. And so, Brother Kevin, we're looking forward to the message here tonight. Well, I want to thank Pastor for this opportunity, and uh, I don't take it lightly. And i um, thankful for every opportunity that I have to preach the Word of God. I love, love this book, and I love what it has to say, and I love every opportunity I get to open it and to teach from it, preach from it, and I get to teach that ninth grade boys class. I love doing that. Um, and so I'm probably just going to pretend you all are my ninth grade boys class tonight, if that's all right. Um, but I am thankful for that. I do want to also say thank you to uh, you all as a church. I, I love this church. I love what it's meant to me and my family. I lo- this is a great place to raise a family. And I'm thankful that my kids get to grow up here and that me and my wife, have, you, you all have been a blessing to us. And so I am just, uh, just wanted to say thank you. If you have your Bible, uh, please turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15, I've been doing some, uh, a while back did some study through uh, the life of Abraham, and uh, it was really a fascinating study, and I I call it a journey of faith, and that's really really what all of us are on, is a journey of faith, but uh, Abraham, I think, really, in a special way, encapsulates that idea of just walking with God by faith, and seeing uh, seeing the different circumstances, and so the the book of Genesis just kind of highlights kind of defining moments along that journey. And uh, this chapter that we're going to look at tonight is one of those. Genesis 15, we're going to read the entire chapter. So starting here in verse 1, it says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness." And he, God, said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he, Abram, said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age." But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites and the Hittites, the Perizzites and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. I want to preach to you tonight a message, and I, I'm, I am thankful for the song, Sydney, and, and Brother Hunter, that message. I, I guess probably the preachers in here can relate, but when you're asked to preach for a special service or some, a special opportunity to preach, maybe I, for me, there's always that time, like a few hours before, when I feel like it's maybe scrapping the whole thing. But, uh, but just hearing Hunter's message and Sydney's, uh, Sydney's song just... It's wonderful how the Lord does that and kind of confirms that this is where it wants us to be. So here's the title tonight. I believe, but how can I know? I believe, but how can I know? Let's, let's uh, have another word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church, Lord, and what it means to me and my family. Thank you for your word. Thank you for salvation through your, your son, Jesus Christ. And I ask that you would just be with me. Help me as I preach your word to be clear, to be truthful. And uh, Lord, that you would uh, empty me of myself and uh, pride and selfishness, and Lord, that I would just speak what you would have me to say, Lord, and just uh, use me, and we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you. You can be seated. Have you ever been in a situation where something was promised to you and you're uh, waiting for that promise to be fulfilled? Perhaps as a child, your uh, mom or dad said, well, we'll go to the park later today. I remember times like that, looking forward to that. Or maybe there's a field trip at school coming up. Maybe a family vacation that you're looking forward to taking. Maybe, ladies, he's promised you a surprise for your anniversary. Those always go well. <laughs> Not personal experience or anything. I'm just, they always go well. <laughs> Perhaps at work there's a raise or a promotion that you've been promised. Maybe you're just waiting on a package from Amazon. Something's been promised to you. You haven't seen it fulfilled yet. You're waiting. Abram's in this situation. Uh, God has promised him a, a multitude of descendants, this great nation that will come of him, and a land that will be his own. But right now, it seemed like it was kind of a waiting game. And uh, so the chapter begins after these things. So let's just kind of sum up and see what things it's talking about. We know in chapter 12, Abram had left his home country. I will say right now, if I say Abraham instead of Abram, I know the name hasn't changed yet, and I know that was significant, but you'll, you'll forgive me if that slips out. I'm going to try. I've got it written down as Abram. I will try. Okay, so Abram had left his home country to follow God's call by faith. God had called him to leave his home country, his kindred, and so he did. And he had taken his wife, Sarah, and his nephew, Lot. Uh, Lot's father and grandfather had passed away there in the land. And so it seems like he was living with Abram and Sarai, so he went with them. And uh, it, over the course of time, a lot of different things take place, but Abram and Lot become very wealthy. But we do know that Abram walks with God by faith, and Lot walks by the lust of his eyes. That's right. And so there comes a point in time where God ends up separating them. They separate, and uh, I, I believe it was of God because of that reason, because faith, those that walk by faith and those that walk by the flesh can't, they're not really going to be able to walk together. So they part ways, and uh, Lot chooses the land by Sodom. We know that. He ends up living in Sodom. Sodom becomes entangled in this big war. Lot ends up in the crossfire, ends up being a prisoner of war. Abraham finds out, this is amazing, arms all of his servants, all 318 of them, which is a lot of servants, he, give, he arms them all. As far as we know, too, they no battle experience that we know of. Arms them all, chases down this army, and wipes them out, rescues the spoils, brings Lot back and his things. And then uh, on the way back, the king of Sodom comes and meets Abram and wants to, wants to give him a reward. And that always cracks me up, too. I, to me, I feel, I don't know if sometimes you do this when you're reading the Bible, but I, I try to kind of insert what I think must have been going through their head. And I, I almost see Abram, you know, he's... He's rescued Lot. He's thankful to God for, you know, being able to rescue his nephew and bring him back. And here comes this king wanting to give him a reward. And I almost picture in Abram's mind thinking, I didn't do this for you, bud. He didn't do it to try to help out this king of Sodom. He, he loved his nephew Lot and he wanted to rescue him. And so he did. So Abram refuses that reward. And actually he gives the reason. He says, um, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Abram was saying, I am trusting in God to provide for me, not you. And so, uh, and that's why in verse one of our text, God says, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You don't need the rewards of Sodom. I am your reward. So Abram is glad to hear this, but he wonders about the future. Remember, he's kind of still in that waiting time. God had promised to make a great nation out of him. For this to happen, he must have a child. Okay, to have lots of descendants, you have to have at least one child. Okay, that's how that works. All right. So God, I know, look, look at this in verse 2. I know that you're my reward, but what wilt thou give me? And that, that seems kind of contradictory to us. And I, I think we have to be careful not to criticize. It's, it's clear, and we'll see it here just in a few verses. Abram is a man of faith, but he's just got some questions. Uh, don't we all have that at times? God, I know you're my reward, but what does that mean for me in the physical world? I'm glad I have a relationship with you, but down here on earth there are some things that don't make a lot of sense to me. And sometimes we can feel like, not maybe that there is, but we can feel like there's this disconnect between what we know to be true about God and what we see with our physical eyes, or between our spiritual relationship with God and our earthly life here. It shouldn't be, but we, we can feel that way sometimes. God, I'm, I'm glad I have this relationship with you, but, but there's this problem at work. I know you've promised to supply all my needs, but there's this expense, like Brother Hunter was saying, there's an expense coming up this month and we weren't expecting it and I don't see any way that we're going to pay it. What wilt thou give me seeing I go moneyless? How many, how many times have we <laughs> asked that, right? 
Eliezer was this servant that was born in Abram's house. And the closest thing that he would have had to a son, and uh, as, it, as it stood, my understanding in the law and the custom of the day, if anything were to happen to Abram, he would be the one that would inherit the estate. And uh, Ab- so Abram wondered, is Eliezer, is he the one that you're going to use to make this great nation? Well, God confirms then in verse number four that no, the Eliezer is not going to be the one. It's going to be your own child that's going to come forth from you. And he's, this is where the great nation is going to come from. And God says, as numerous as the stars in the sky, if you, if you can count them. And then verse six tells us, love this verse, Abram's simple response, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Amen. And he didn't understand it all. He didn't even see how it was going to happen. That's right. He just believed God. And God counted it to him for righteousness. Scripture makes this abundantly clear. You do not become righteous by doing good things or by getting all the bad things out of your life. You become righteous by believing God. And this is the difference between Christianity and all the religions of the world. It's why, Brother Perkle, we give that book done to all our visitors that come and visit. Why is that? Because all the other religions in the world, you have to constantly be doing and doing to try to please the God or the gods. But in Christianity, everything, everything that needed to be done for you to be right with God was already done by Christ on the cross. And so even though Abram lived before the cross, he was still justified by faith. It was no different for him. He still had to believe God. So then God affirms to Abraham in verse 7 for the second time that this land would be his inheritance. He says, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And just, I mean, just in verse 6, it talked about Abraham believed God. But then here in verse number 8, he says, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He still be- he believed God. And we know that he did because God counted it to him for righteousness. God recognized Abraham's faith. But Abram is still struggling. How can I know that you're going to give me this land? Right now, he doesn't own any of it. He's just wandering through the land. He, uh, he believed God, but how could he be sure? I, I, I really think he was fighting the same battle that the father of the demoniac boy in the Gospels was fighting. You remember the story. The father brings this, his son to the disciples, try to cast out the de- demon. They weren't able to do it. Jesus shows up and t- says, just to believe. And he says these words, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And that's, seem, again, seems contradictory, but I think we can be there sometimes. We believe this is true. We believe God, but help thou my unbelief. At the same time, there, there's some things, how can I know? How can I be sure? Well, notice that uh, God doesn't directly answer the question. In fact, he begins giving what we would say uh, would be rather bizarre instructions. He sends Abram to get a cow, a goat, a sheep, and two birds. So Abram takes these animals, he cuts them in half, sets them across from each other in a row. Doesn't cut the birds in half, but sets them across from each other. And this might seem like a strange way for God to confirm his promise. Um, Today, when we make a contract, a lot of times we'll sign papers or have them notarized. My wife and I are in the process of buying a house right now, and there's a lot of paperwork (laughs) to be signed to prove this and prove that and sign that you're going to do this and that and a lot of things. But uh, reading some commentaries... um, some of them believe that perhaps in Abram day, Abram's day, one of their versions of a contract would be where two people would meet amidst a bunch of divided animals like this. The two would come together in the middle, and it was a visual way maybe of saying that uh, if I don't hold up my end of the deal, may this happen to me. Um, we've, uh, in, the, in the time of the kings and the prophets, there was an expression that was used pretty frequently, God do so to me and more. If It actually came up the other day in 1 Samuel when Samuel woke up and Eli said, tell me everything, God do so to thee and more. Basically saying that if you don't tell me everything, then may God do to you what he was going to do to me. And that was a common expression in that time of the kings and the prophets. This is something similar. By meeting in the middle of these two, uh, these two rows of animals, uh, the two fo- folks would be saying, if I don't keep up my end of the deal, may God do to me what I did to these animals. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what was, was going on. I hope maybe you helped clear that up a little bit. But notice... Abram and God did not meet halfway between the animals. Look at verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. God put Abram to sleep. 
And then he, he begins the next four verses here. He starts talking about what is going to happen to his descendants in Egypt. So he starts to answer a little bit. You know, Abram's saying, when, when are we going to get this land? God gives him a little bit of the picture. Um, not maybe the full thing yet, but at least enough to say, yeah, your descendants are going to be a servant in this other land for 400 years, and then they'll come back and inherit the land. He talks about the reason, even, that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The Canaanites that lived in the land at the time, God was giving them space. God was giving them more time, but... At the same time, he said, I am going to judge them eventually, and then that's when I'm going to bring your descendants in. You're going to inherit this land. So he begins to explain kind of short answer why he hasn't inherited the land yet. God, God does this. But notice something significant happens here. And this to me is, is so, uh, so significant to this whole passage. In verse number 17, it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So who's the smoking furnace and the burning lamp here? Well, it's not Abraham. He's, he's asleep. <laughs> and the only other one in this passage is God. So I think it's pretty clear that this is God manifesting himself to Abraham. And in verse 17 here, God himself comes all the way through these animals while Abraham is sleeping. Instead of meeting him halfway, it's almost as if God was saying, Abraham, I'm making a completely one-sided agreement with you. I'm not asking you to meet me halfway because you can't. I will do it all. God makes this one-sided covenant. It says there in verse 18, he made a covenant with Abram to give his descendants this land. Abraham in himself had no way of fulfilling God's promises. He couldn't guarantee the pregnancy, right? And we know that it would eventually get to the point where they were so old that humanly speaking, it was impossible. It's why they laughed when God later confirmed this promise. He currently owned no property in Canaan. How could he trust that God would keep his promise to inherit the land? Here it is. Abram could know because when he could do nothing, God came all the way and confirmed his promise to him. So you might wonder if God can be trusted. Maybe you're facing a difficult situation and you see no way out. You, you know the facts about God. You know what the Bible says, but you don't see any physical, tangible evidence that he's going to come through. You have no way of making anything happen. Maybe uh, uh, you're out of a job and you have no prospect of employment on the horizon. Maybe you uh, or a loved one has an incurable disease. Maybe as a parent, you have a child with a health problem. I think about this. I, I tell you, what, until I had kids, I had no idea how many things there were to worry about, you know? <laughs> these, these little guys that I didn't even know for the first 25 odd years of my life, and now I worry all the time about them. And, and all of you that are parents in this room, you, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm thankful that I haven't had to go through this to the extent that maybe some of you in this room have, but just thinking of the helplessness of that. I mean, as a parent, right, you want to be the one to fix everything. Dad's, dad can do anything, right? He can fix everything. But, but when you sit by their bedside and, and you can't do anything about that health problem, I, I haven't been in that scenario, but I can only imagine the helplessness. All, all I'm saying is life has a way of throwing situations at you that make you say, God, I believe you, but how do I know you're good? How do I know you're going to provide? How, how do I know it's going to be all right? How do I know it's all going to work according to your goodwill? How, how do I know it's in your hands? I believe, help thou mine unbelief. What, whereby shall I know? What wilt thou give me? Well, if you're a believer, what, wasn't there another situation in which you found yourself hopeless, in which you could do nothing? Talking about your sin problem. Do you remember, do you remember when you realized that you were bound for hell? What, what did God do then? You remember when he un you, you understood how he came all the way? When you could do nothing to save yourself? He came all the way to save you. You didn't have to meet him halfway. You couldn't. You were dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. But Jesus came all the way to the earth to pay for your salvation. Just as God promised Abram the son he needed, God gave us his only begotten son, whom we desperately needed. So what did you do? <laughs> you, you just placed your faith in him. There's nothing else you could do, right? And, and if you're here, I don't want to assume if there's anybody here that hasn't done that, tonight could be the night you could do that. Simple, simple facts are that you're a sinner who's going to face judgment for your sin before a holy God, but there is a Savior that loved you enough to come all the way and take that penalty for you. If you'll come to him in faith, he will save you. Uh, John 6, 37, I believe, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I love that verse. Christian, if he came all the way to save you when you could not save yourself, 
then is there any other situation that you can't trust him with? Well, let me ask you this. Is, your, is the current situation that you're concerned about, is that more impossible for you to solve than your sin problem was? If you should ever doubt his trustworthiness, look back at what he did to prove you. When, when we couldn't come to him, when we couldn't do anything, he came all the way to us, died for us, and rose again. I love that song. He came to me. He came to me. When I could not come to where Jesus was, he came to me. So I, I believe God, but how can I know? I, I just want some, some confirmation. God gave you all the confirmation you will ever need when he came all the way to the cross for you, died, was buried, and rose again three days later. I've been, I've been reading a little bit about this and, and doing, doing some reading and just thinking about the resurrection. And obviously we talk a lot about the cross, which, which we should. But to think about the resurrection, maybe sometimes we don't realize how much of a game changer that was in the course of history. Because, I mean, the Jews, you know, they thought that Jesus was just some blasphemous maniac, right? And even today there are scoffers that say, well, they say he did miracles, they say he's God, but he was just a good person and all of that. But what they can't answer is the empty tomb. And that confirmed everything. That validated everything that Jesus said. So when Jesus said that I and my Father are one, when he talked about the repentance that is needed, the faith that is needed, and that he could save, when he said all of that, he, everything was validated when God raised Jesus from the dead the third day. And so if you, you talk about needing confirmation, what more confirmation do we need than a God who would, just like he did with Abraham, who would come all the way when we couldn't do anything? Now that... That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to heal you or your loved one of that disease. God promises, I, I word it this way, God does not promise to solve all of our problems in a manner consistent with our desires. But he does promise to always work according to his sovereign will and his unchanging nature to bring glory to himself. Amen. That might be by healing. It might be by giving grace to suffer the disease. But either way, he's going to supply. Paul wrote about, you know, God, Jesus showed this to Paul. My grace is sufficient. Whether it's grace for saving, grace for healing, grace for suffering, you can trust God. He's going to give you the grace that you need. So, so, so it, what, what's a, what, do we, what do we take away from this, this story with Abraham here? Well, hopefully, as I mentioned, if, if there's anyone here that, that's not saved, you've got a sin problem you can't do anything about. But Jesus came all the way to die on the cross to pay your penalty of sin and save you. And then he rose again, giving him victory over sin and death. And if you place your trust in him today, you can be completely forgiven. And if you, if you want, there will be people up front tonight that you can talk to about that. If you're already saved, then you know his trustworthiness firsthand. You, you know what he did for you. You know what he's done for you. And in whatever situation you're facing... You can trust him. And it is not, I hope this comes across the right way, it is not my intention to, to downplay whatever you're going through. Because we all, we all go through those situations. All, all I'm saying is I, I really just want to be an encouragement. A lot of times as a young preacher, you know, we want to get in the pulpit and preach the hellfire and brimstone type of message. But tonight I just wanted to be an encouragement. And uh, as I said, with, with everything that's been preached and mentioned already, I feel like this just kind of is, is another extension of that that the Lord can use. Hope, well, <laughs> I want the Lord to be able to use this. And uh, just that encourage you that if, if he came all the way to save you, he can be trusted in whatever situation that you're in. There's not a situation that, that's more impossible for him to handle. Well, I can save you. I can come all the way, die on the cross, and rise from the dead to save you. But I don't know about that bill. You're out of luck there, bucko. God, that's not going to happen. God, God, will take care of, God will take care of you. And you, you can trust him. I want to finish with this. You know, um, you have friends, neighbors, coworkers, family members, maybe, who need to know that trustworthy God. And they're, they're going through situations just like you are, but they don't, they don't know the God who came all the way for them. And when I think of that, it, it, it really, make, really makes sense why the world is so dark, so depressed. I mean, we see fear, we see hatred, we see uh, alcoholism, we see drugs, we see suicide, depression, staggering rates. 
And, but, but all of that becomes clear to me when, when I realize they're going through the same things I'm going through, but they don't know the God that I know. Amen. They don't know the one that came all the way from the, what, what do you do in that situation? Yeah. It makes sense why they would turn to those things, but they're not going to help them. They need to know the one who came all the way for them. And you, if you're saved, you can tell them that he did for them what he did for you. He came all the way to save them and he can be trusted for salvation and then for any other situation in life. And really, that's, that's what I want to share with you. And I just want to be an encouragement that, um, you know, I, I believe, but how can I know? You can know he came all the way when you couldn't do anything. He, he'll, he'll, he'll be there. He'll be there in the situation that you're, that you're going through. He can, he, can, he, can, he can still work, and you can trust him. I'd like to ask you to stand to your feet. And uh, I'll go ahead and close in prayer, and then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Pastor. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, it's not, um, it's not my words, Lord, that are going to help, but your word makes clear that we can trust you. And I thank you for coming all the way, Lord, to, uh, to save us, to show your love for us, to uh, commend your love toward us, as the Bible says. And um, I, I thank you for that. Thank you for what it means for me. And. Uh,